What's up YouTube, Ryan here, and today I'm going to talk about things that I've been hinting at in my other videos without realizing it. Today, it's all about daily prayer. So when I kind of reinvented my YouTube channel and decided to kind of pick it back up again and have some fun with it and record some videos just to kind of entertain myself, uh, the first couple of videos that I did, I didn't realize there was this underlying theme of prayer in the video. So today I want to talk about prayer, but in order to do that, I think I need to be brutally honest and um, kind of bare my soul a little bit and confess uh, to you, to anyone that's watching, why I'm doing this. Um, if you haven't gathered by now, I'm not an evangelical. Um, if you haven't gathered by now, I don't even call myself a Protestant, and that simply comes from my understanding of the the history and origin of the word Protestant. So I'm not a Protestant. I'm not Roman Catholic. I'm not Eastern Orthodox or anything like that. But so it's kind of weird, you know, but when I was an evangelical and kind of wrapped up in postmodern American evangelicalism, looking back on it now, I have to confess that I was at my most narcissistic that I've ever been. Prayer wasn't anything like the Bible instructs it to be. It wasn't anything like the Christians throughout history have always done. It was me and my Bible and my feelings and my emotions. It was me not trusting in the external word of God about prayer. It was me waiting literally for the sun to come out from behind a cloud and thinking that that was a sign. Or sometimes even reading a billboard on the side of the road and thinking that was a sign. And that kind of stuff, looking for signs and wonders in nature and all of that is explicitly forbidden in scriptures. So, but the driving force that led me inward to self was in fact a search for that authentic Christian experience, or as some evangelicals say it, that book of Acts church. There's lots of evangelicals and charismatics that are chasing after that book of Acts church. So that's what I'm talking about today, is that Book of Acts church. And I hate to say it, and you're not going to like it, but that Book of Acts church is found in tradition and liturgy. And it's found, when it comes to prayer, in the liturgy of the hours, or the divine office. That's where it's found. We read all throughout the Old Testament, if we're careful, we can see it, the pattern of prayer that has been established by God for his people. We can see certain kinds of prayers for certain reasons at certain times throughout the day. We can see the instruction to pray at certain times, specific times throughout the day. That's how they caught Daniel and threw him into the lion's den because he was praying as he was supposed to at a certain hour of the day. Now, I know what you're going to say. Oh, well, all that's Old Testament stuff. Jesus came. That's all done. Jesus did not come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. And so when we read in the book of Acts that the apostles are going to the temple at certain times throughout the day for the hour of prayer, or when they're praying at nighttime because it was the time of prayer, or even things like the falling of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost at 9 a.m., because it's a prayer hour, we see the apostles and continuing to engage themselves in the pattern that had been established from the Old Testament. Why? Because Christ did not come to get rid of the law. Christ now fills the law. So um, here's kind of how they thought about it, and here's how the earliest Christians interpreted this liturgy of the hours kind of stuff that was being established already in the book of Acts. It was filled with Christ. So when we pray in the evening, there was, you know, thanking God for protection throughout the day, praying and asking for protection throughout the night, trusting in his promises to take care of us, remembering that he instructed us to pray in the evening. And also as it developed over the first few centuries of the church, the anticipation of the resurrection. And so then when we rise in the morning, we recall joyfully the resurrection 
of Jesus. So the tradition of morning prayer is no longer this obligation of the law. It is this joyful recalling of the resurrection. And when we pray at nine o'clock in the morning, as the apostles often did, we recall the trial that the innocent one, God himself in human flesh, was condemned in our place. And when we pray at noon, we recall the darkness that fell on the earth and the sun refusing to shine its light. And we recall that the innocent Son of God bore in his flesh the sins of all mankind. It wasn't about the scourging. It wasn't about the crown of thorns. It wasn't about the nails. It wasn't about the, the suffocating. It was about becoming the sin of the world and the wrath of God being poured on you, onto, onto Christ, when it should have been poured on you and poured out onto me. And what did Christ pray? Did he cry out some flowery prayer that he concocted in his own heart? Or did he cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Praying as the church had always done from the Psalms. When we pray at three, we recall in our minds that Christ died. I recall um, at the moment, currently in my mind now, I can think of the one of my favorite Lenten hymns, and I don't remember what it's called, but the lyric that sticks out in my mind the most is, O sorrow, dread, our God is dead upon the cross extended. That our sin is so great that God himself Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, had to incorporate into his divine nature, my human nature, suffer and die. That my sin is so great, it killed God. And then we pray in the evening, again, the pattern repeats itself. And now we're waiting with anticipation the joy of the resurrection. And this is how the Old Testament tradition of praying certain prayers and reading certain psalms and reading certain scriptures and singing certain hymns at different times throughout the day should not be done away with, but finds its fulfillment in Christ. Christ is in all and fills all. And he promises, I will be with you always. And we have to find him and experience him where he promises to be. And that is in his word and in his sacraments. Take this and eat it. This is my body given for you. Take this and drink it. This is my blood of the new covenant given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And that's what we participate in in the weekly schedule of the church when we go to, and I'm going to say it, the Mass on Sunday. Or should I say it this way, the Eucharist on Sunday. I think it's a communion is a good word, but it's been dirtied by um, the heresy involved with evangelical doctrine. So I choose to call it either the Mass or the Eucharist. That is the weekly pattern established for the church uh, in corporateness of worship. But there's also a privateness to worship and prayer as we're instructed to go into our room and pray quietly. But even there, Jesus says, when you pray, use these words, our Father who art in heaven. God is a God of order. And we see the apostles continuing to do things decently and in the proper order to use their own words. Because God is a God of order. That is why, historically speaking, worship has always been structured, liturgical, and ordered. That is why the apostles themselves participated in structured, organized, ordered prayer. A prayer life centered on what God had established and now filled to the brim with Christ himself. All of this Old Testament stuff now finds its completion and fulfillment in Christ, not its abolishment because of Jesus. So uh, that's kind of it, really. Maybe this is just an introductory into the Liturgy of the Hours. I To go into uh, Matins and especially the litany, which is one of the greatest prayers, and quite frankly, one of the prayers we as the church need to be praying right now today because of everything going on in Texas and the turmoil that's going on throughout the country because politics is just <laughs> so wicked these days on both sides of the story because we spent the last eight years being divided. So the litany, uh, that's one that would be fun to talk about. Vespers or evening prayer or compline. 
certain prayers, certain hymns, certain songs, certain psalms throughout the day to find and to experience collectively, corporately with the church as one body, the fullness of Christ. Because the evangelical way of doing it is very narcissistic. It's very inward focused. It, I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. The church's way that she's always done it is very external, outside of ourselves, and corporate. And by participating in the Liturgy of the Hours, even if we do it by ourselves, we're still participating in that endless prayer that has been rising from the church since her founding, as the Bible tells us, to pray without ceasing. And somewhere, in some time zone, someone is praying the Liturgy of the Hours, and the prayer continues. So praying the Liturgy of the Hours is just you stepping into that unending prayer of the church. It's hard, I understand, for evangelicals, it was hard for me to look at this and go, how is this not dead, lifeless traditions of men? The truth is, it's the tradition of the church established by God himself, finding its fulfillment in Christ. And we have clear examples in the scriptures that the apostles participated in this. We have clear examples from the writings of the earliest Christians that this continued. And Romophobia, which leads Protestants and evangelicals to be afraid of this liturgical, structured, organized way of doing things, it leads them to be afraid because Rome does that. Even the Roman Catholic Church does it because it has been passed along to them from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. It is wrong to look at this medieval 16th century way of doing it and thinking, calling that authentic Christian worship. Well, that medieval way of doing it has its origins back into the first century way of doing it, which was structured, organized, and liturgical. Now, 1500 years or 500 years after the fact now of that medieval worship style, does Lutheran worship look the way it did when, when Luther got booted from the Roman Catholic Church and said, you know what, to heck with your doctrines, I'm still Catholic. No, Lutheran worship doesn't look exactly like it did 500 years ago, just like the medieval worship doesn't look like it did 1500 years before that, but it is all a branch of the same tree. And what evangelicalism does is it looks at this beautiful tree of the way, I hit the microphone, it looks at the beautiful tree of the way the church has done something and said, you know what, I don't like that, I find that dull and boring. And instead of maybe kind of hedging the tree a little bit and reshaping it back to more what it used to look like, it just digs up the tree, throws it out, and plants a brand new one. Kowo, contemporary worship. Me, 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 me. It's all about me. Gotta find my purpose. That is not the historic Christian experience. I'm sorry, it's just not. The gift of the Liturgy of the Hours is exactly that, a gift. And it's not a law. Oh, our human nature loves to turn it into a law, doesn't it? I have to do the Liturgy of the Hours. No, you can do the Liturgy of the Hours. And as I say in every episode I've done so far, formal episode, not the, the two that I had to do the other day, <clears throat> it doesn't make you more holy. It doesn't make you more righteous. It doesn't please God more to do it this certain way, to use beads or to... Uh, burn incense or to pray the liturgy of the hours. It doesn't make you a better Christian. But what I found from coming out of evangelicalism into biblical historic Christianity is that these traditions established by God, part, uh, handed down by the apostles, they protect me from me. And it's all about Jesus Christ and him crucified for me. That's why the Liturgy of the Hours is such a gift. Do I get to pray all of the hours every day? Heck no. I've got work. I've got kids. I've got stuff I've got to be doing. But there's abbreviated versions. There's apps for your cell phone, like the Pray Now app offered by Concordia Publishing House. Or when I'm home, Treasury of Daily Prayers, which has everything all laid out for me. Every day, Old Testament, New Testament, a psalm, a prayer, the collect of the church for that day. Um, if it's a feast day where we, the church recalls a certain uh, father that has died, like 
Uh, I think recently we recalled John the Baptist, the forerunner who pointed to Christ. You remember the one who said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? There's a day that the church actually chooses to remember him. So there'll be a writing about that. And in this one, there is a writing from an early church father. And here's the thing. Um, it's, it, when I was an evangelical and someone tried to tell me, well, you know, the earliest church fathers would write or they've said about this. And I would say, oh, no, 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 no. The Bible alone. Didn't stop me from having a Rick Warren book on my shelf. Didn't stop me from having the case for Christ on my shelf. Didn't stop, doesn't stop evangelicals from having books by T.D. Jakes or Joyce Myers on their shelves. Why do, why do we get to read modern Christian authors? But it's inappropriate to read ancient Christian authors. There are writings of people who were trained by the apostles themselves that have been preserved for us today. And when we read the scriptures and we read the writings of the earliest Christians, we realize very quickly, postmodern American evangelicalism is not historic Christianity. The Liturgy of the Hours is a gift. It is a blessing. It is an inclusion in the practices and discipline of the corporate body and bride of Christ. It saves us from ourselves. Having readings picked out for me saves me from the mysticism of thinking that there's some sort of divine revelation coming to me from the Word. And instead, it shows me that the word of God is not basic instructions before leaving earth. It is the story of my salvation. It is an account of everything that God has done to redeem me from sin, death, and the power of the devil. That authentic Christian worship experience that you evangelicals are so desperately searching for, it's in the historic liturgies of the church. And I understand our emotions are addictive. People, we're by nature addicted to our emotions, but we have to step out of our emotions. We are a people called to believe by faith, not by sight. So until next time, I'm Ryan, and God bless you on account of the suffering, death, and resurrection of his only begotten Son on the cross in your place. Oh!